I was standing at the site of what most people from my generation and maybe your generation remember as Riverside Hospital. We're looking at the Veterans Skyway Bridge. I'm over on the west side of the river. And some of you might even recognize where I am because this is school time. I am standing uh, right at the TPS uh, headquarters building. But if we went back in time 180 years, we're standing on the Stickney Farm. This was where Benjamin Franklin Stickney, his daughter Indiana, and his sons, one and two, made their home. And this is where two Stickney shed the only blood in the Toledo War. Today we're going to talk about the Toledo War and how it was a result of the transportation advances that came from the Maumee River here and a canal that passed right back here and how that canal was so important for both states that they were willing to fight over it and how the fight resulted in this land becoming part of Ohio and the unification and creation of the city of Toledo. It's kind of funny to think about this part of what we would almost consider the edge downtown Toledo today, this very urban place being the farm of this guy, Stickney, whose name shows up all throughout Toledo history. Well, we're going to come back to Stickney's farm and we're going to come back to a couple of different wars over the course of today because we're going to talk about war, Toledo, and the Toledo War a little bit separately. We're picking up this lecture where the last one left off. We talked about the War of 1812 and how the War of 1812 ended one era of, of the different native nations um, that lived in this land and the European nations that came over and fought over this land and eventually the American domination of it after the War of 1812. And we set it open this area to settlement of the American folks from the East. So what happens right after the War of 1812 is you get like a constellation of settlements, lots and lots of little small towns throughout the region. So before the war, you already had Maumee. Maumee was already kind of a place before the War of 1812. Um, Orleans of the North, we talked about when we talked about Fort Meigs, uh, because Orleans of the North was this village that was basically where Fort Meigs is in Perrysburg today. And by the time we get to 1817, we see lots of other new settlements crop up. Not all of them have a name yet, and few of them have the name that they're going to have today. Um, but basically, these settlements are cropping up around what is today Toledo, Waterville, Perrysburg, and Grand Rapids. You're seeing lots of small groupings of farms or small villages starting to form in these places by the time we get to 1817. Among this constellation of settlements are some within today's Toledo boundaries, and a few of these uh, we've talked about already. Um, the two most important of them are Port Lawrence and Vistula. So Port Lawrence forms in uh, in 1817 for the first time, and it gets incorporated and chartered, and people start moving there. And then there's like some financial trouble, and they kind of shut down the company that was establishing Port Lawrence, and then it comes back a little bit. But we really do look back to 1817 as the founding of Port Lawrence. Now. One of the early settlers in Port Lawrence is going to be uh, B.F. Stickney. And Stickney's going to be there for a while, and he's going to get kind of fed up. He says, Port Lawrence isn't moving fast enough or aggressive enough to be the future great city of the world. So that's when Ben Stickney moves down to the place that we saw at the beginning of the video, near today's TPS headquarters, near the big Veterans Memorial Bridge and the Craig Bridge downtown. Um, and... Stickney helps organize this new place called Vistula in 1833. Now, there were other places within today's Toledo city limits too. One of them was called Marengo. Marengo was a small town um, at River Road and Marengo Street, uh, sort of behind OLPH. If you can imagine drawing a line from OLPH Parish in South Toledo down to the river, Marengo was about there. Um, there was another small village called Austerlitz. And Austerlitz was basically where today's Walbridge Park is near the zoo. Uh, that's the little town of Austerlitz on the river. Um, the bigger town, and one that actually kind of took off for a while, uh, was the town of Manhattan. And the town of Manhattan was located at Summit and Souter, at the very end of the canal. And we'll try to look at some maps that show you exactly where the canal went through today's Toledo, because it went right through the middle of town. Um, Manhattan was where the canal ended. The canal ended at Manhattan, and everybody thought Manhattan is going to be the great city of the future. 
um, because the canal ends there, stuff will get loaded on ships at Manhattan, and then it'll sail out onto the lake. Instead, what happens is a side cut of the canal, which we'll talk about in a little bit, a side cut gets dug from the canal into downtown Toledo because the people in what is going to become Toledo, what was then Port Lawrence, wanted access to the canal. And the canal builders from the state said, we can do that. Um, and that side cut becomes way more popular than the full canal route out to Manhattan. So let's talk about how we get a Toledo out of these two towns. Um, by 1833, Port Lawrence and Vistula, and Vistula is basically brand new at this time, they realize we can't do this on our own. If we're going to really become this future great city of the West, we need to team up. We need to be one city to become the major town on the Maumee River. And I, I say the navigable Maumee. When we talk about navigable water, it's water that a ship can get up. So you guys all know today, you can get a ship up as far as like Rossford, right? Um, we see the, the ships that come in near the I-75 bridge and the river stays pretty deep, especially by 1800 standards. The river stays deep enough that back in the day, you could have got an old fashioned ship uh, up to about Rossford. But after that, the water gets really shallow and it would be really difficult to get a ship any further up than Rossford. Despite that, Maumee was trying to be a big port. Um, Perrysburg thought they had a chance of being the big port. Um, and definitely these, these other places along the river think that they have a chance too. So um, when we get to 1833, Port Lawrence and Vishula realize we're right next to each other. We can make this work. So if you look at this map real quickly, this map really shows you why downtown Toledo is the way it is today. So here's Port Lawrence over on the left side. Here's Vistula right above me. Um, and notice that Vistula was built with its streets going straight into the Maumee River, not at an angle. Okay, so Vistula is set up on one grid. Port Lawrence was set up on a different grid. Port Lawrence, because of the bend in the river, also has its streets going straight down into the river, but at a different angle. And if you look really carefully here, um, what we're looking at right here in the middle of them is Cherry Street. So if you can think of where the bridge is and where Channel 11 is and where kind of the edge downtown going into North Toledo is, um, right here was almost the dividing line. Orange Street is right here and Orange goes into the Old Oak, um, which is today Jackson. Um, but that, that Orange Street was basically the edge. It was the dividing line between Port Lawrence and Vistula. And that's right where the blade is today and where the, uh, the main fire station is downtown today. Jackson Street, Government Center, that's the dividing line between the town of Port Lawrence and the town of Vistula. They come together. Um, and as the city becomes more prosperous, the city starts becoming a point of contention. Now, they do name themselves Toledo, as I've told you before. We know it's named after Toledo, Spain. We don't know exactly why. There's all kinds of great stories, but we don't know exactly why. The location, however, becomes a real point of contention. And this is where we got to start talking about canals. Canals end up being so important in this part of history. Back it up to 1817. Remember, this is the same time Port Lawrence is getting platted. Um, and the same time people are starting to move in, uh, the, the American settlers from the east are starting to move into what will become Toledo. That same year, construction begins on the Erie Canal. Now, the Erie Canal is a really big deal in American history, and we don't talk enough about it. Prior to the Erie Canal, the only way to get merchandise from like New York out to where we live today was putting it on a wagon and over the top of a set of mountains. As you can imagine, taking horses and wagons over mountains is not a great deal of fun. So it was expensive, it was slow, it was really no solution at all. Uh, the governor of New York was a guy named uh, DeWitt Clinton. And Clinton uh, believed we could dig canals like they had in Europe to connect places. Um, and canals could make it possible to circumvent the mountains and get goods from the Great Lakes region out to New York City. Why does Clinton do this? Why does he think it's a big idea? Because he understands if you can be the person to bring all the trade from the entire Great Lakes region to your city, your city and your state are going to become fabulously wealthy. And DeWitt Clinton was absolutely right. 
Um, this is New York City down here. The Hudson River is right here. And then this red line snaking across from Albany to Rochester and then to Buffalo at Lake Erie is the Erie Canal. People thought it was a joke. They called it Clinton's Ditch or Clinton's Folly. But the Erie Canal immediately becomes a financial boom, a giant success. And it makes New York something kind of funny to think about. Everybody today, if you said, what's, what's the, the number one city in America? You're going to say New York, maybe Los Angeles. But New York is always going to be, if you're saying East Coast, New York is going to be what you're going to say is the great city of America. And it wasn't that way prior to the Erie Canal. New York was one of the great cities of the East Coast, but you just as easily could have said Philly or Boston. New York becomes the wealthy city. New York becomes the center of trade because of the Erie Canal. And other parts of the country are noticing this. And they go, huh being the end of a canal is kind of a big deal. So lots of cities start fighting over being the end of different canals. You're going to see it happen in Akron. You're going to see it happen towards Cleveland. You're going to see it happen in Toledo. Okay. Everybody wants to be the terminus of a canal. And we'll talk about why in just a little bit. New York and Buffalo become fantastically wealthy cities because of the canal. Other cities realize that canals that would then connect the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River are the next step. And that's going to make other people fantastically wealthy too. So in 1825, surveyors lay out a canal that would connect Cincinnati to the Maumee River. So basically following the Miami River up the border between, roughly close to the border between Indiana and Ohio, up to, um, uh, uh, up towards Fort Loramie, and then up to Defiance, and then along the Auglaize River from Defiance up to the Maumee to Toledo. They come up with this plan to almost like create a water I-75 going down the, uh, the left end of the state, the west end of the state. These canals are going to be enormous for Ohio. They're going to make Ohio like one of the most powerful states in the Union. Because now Ohio's markets are going to be open to everybody. If you grow food in Ohio, you can put that stuff on a barge and you can send it down the canal to Cincinnati where it gets put on a boat from Cincinnati to St. Louis, St. Louis to New Orleans, and then anywhere in Latin America or anywhere in the South. Okay. But you could also put it on a, on a ship going out of Toledo and then over to Buffalo and down to all the ports in New York. Ohio farmers could now sell their stuff anywhere if this canal opened. And so the canal is a really, really big deal. Today, I think we look at the canal as, oh, that weird old thing. Yeah, there's some, it, Grand Rapids has some old stuff. Warville and Mommy have some old stuff. We don't think about that canal much. You got to believe me that back then that canal was all of that and a bag of chips and a can of Coke. Uh, it was a really, really, really big deal where that canal went. So this is the backdrop to the Toledo War. We've talked about wars. We've talked about Toledo. Let's talk about why on earth do Michigan and Ohio fight over Toledo? It's all about the canal. So here's the deal. And without getting into all the details, which I will be the first to admit get boring. When Ohio's northern border was drawn, they said it's basically going to range from the southern tip of Lake Michigan over to the mouth of Maumee Bay. Well, they didn't have really great maps then in, in 1803. And pretty soon, surveyors for Michigan, as we start moving through the 1820s, surveyors for Michigan say, uh, we think that goes a different place than originally thought. And so Michigan's border, they believe, is going to keep coming south, right? So this disputed Toledo Strip that you see above me, the bottom is what Michigan says the border should be. Michigan says the border between Michigan and Ohio should basically be down here where you know, Toledo, um, Sylvania, Springfield, all of those, all the way out to, to Williams County, all of that should be part of Michigan. It's about a thousand square miles total. Should all be part of Michigan. And then Ohio would start with Perrysburg. Um, Ohio said, no, 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 no. You, we drew a line a long time ago that was further to the north that included Toledo. So what they're fighting on is this unresolved dispute. Nobody had ever really said, 
This is exactly the border. So now that there are plans for a canal that is going to come up the Maumee River, empty into Lake Erie, and make somebody really rich, now both sides really, really, really want this Toledo area. So this brings us back to Benjamin Franklin Stickney, our, our perpetual character in Ohio history at this point. Ben Stickney, <coughs> by the way, his name is Benjamin Franklin Stickney because his uncle is Benjamin Franklin, or maybe it was his mom's uncle was Benjamin Franklin. Um, but he is a direct relative to the Benjamin Franklin. Um, Stickney originally wants the area to be Michigan. So when he's living in Port Lawrence, he's like, boys, we're going to be part of Michigan. Everybody do everything you can to be part of Michigan. Why? Because the taxes were lower. It wasn't because they love Michigan. It's not because they thought of it. But they just wanted lower taxes. Okay? Boys, we're going to be part of Michigan. Then he starts realizing, Ohio's already a state. All right, Ohio's already got this. Ohio's, Ohio already has that. Fellas, I think we should be part of Ohio. And again, for for reasons that are primarily financial in nature, Stickney manages to get all of these people in the new village at Toledo to switch horses and say, we want to be part of Ohio. So in 1835, there's this young governor up in Michigan named Mason. Um, Ohio's governor uh, uh, is is a uh, with, uh, guy with the last name of Lucas. Um, and Ohio uh, organizes a new county. We had not organized any counties up here yet, but they organized Lucas County to include land on both the west and east side of the river. This is a direct, like, shots fired at Michigan, right? Yeah, that territory you're claiming, we're making it into a county, and we're naming it after the governor. So Ohio organizes uh, Lucas County up here in the Toledo Strip, and then the Michigan governor, Mason, uh, activates his militia and send him, sends him to the border. When he sends his state militia or state National Guard to the border, Ohio sends its National Guard up toward the border. Now, before we switch off of this, I want to show you something on this map that exists to this day, and it's a weird little historical oddity that we'll talk about. I want you to notice how there are two little tips, a nib of Point Place and a nib of Shoreland, that are not in the brown color. That place today is called Lost Peninsula. Um, Lost Peninsula is a part of Michigan that you can't get to without driving through Ohio or you know swimming your happy little self across uh, that little little wedge mommy bay right there. But this this part was lost in the Toledo War, um, lost with the uh, with the settlement of this. I guess I kind of gave away the ending there. Um, and it's still known as Lost Peninsula today. And there's like Lost Peninsula Yacht Club up there and and not much else because it's a real small part of terri bit of territory. Um, there is also an island just off of there called Turtle Island, a very, very small island out in Lake Erie that has Mich the Michigan-Ohio border running right through it. Uh, Turtle, Turtle Island is split between two states. So this brings us to the Toledo War. So March 31st of 1835, uh, governor Lucas of Ohio arrives in Perrysburg with 600 National Guard. Um, the governor of Michigan is not going to take this sitting down. He brings a thousand National Guard into Toledo itself. Okay, so keep in mind, Toledo back then is a city of, you know, several hundred people, and now you got a thousand militia occupying this city to try and keep it for Michigan. Um, the president this time is Andrew Jackson, who is. Uh, to be charitable, an interesting character in American history. Um, Jackson knows that Michigan really has the better claim on the Toledo Strip. And this is a sad truth that I am forced to accept. Um, had things been done honorably and legitimately, we would probably be part of Michigan. But we ain't, so there you go. Jackson decides, who do I go with? Michigan, that's a territory and has no congressman, or Ohio that has more than a dozen congressmen. Hmm, tough call. Who can help me more? Ohio. Ohio wins. Um, so Jackson wants Ohio to keep the strip. Um, the president has made his wishes known, but Michigan is not backing down. And on April 26th, about a month after the two militias get activated, a group from Michigan attacks a group of Ohio surveyors. They fire shots at a group of, of surveyors 
uh, out by uh, today's Lyons, Ohio, between Metamora and Lyons, if you're going 20 miles west of Toledo. Um, they end up taking nine prisoners of war. And uh, this battle, which was called the Battle of Phillips Corners, is the only actual exchange of gunfire that takes place in the Toledo War uh, with these nine POW taken. Throughout that spring and summer, the tensions keep increasing and increasing and increasing. And on July 15th, the incident that I told you about at the beginning of the video happens. And this handsome devil above me, Two Stickney, uh, stabs a sheriff's deputy from Michigan. Um, it is a not life-threatening wound. The guy lives, but it is the only blood drawn in the Toledo War. Um, now, what's funny, uh, the governor of Michigan did not find this funny at all. Uh, they believed that Two Stickney had violated a Michigan law that said you can't vote in Ohio. I swear to you, that was a law. Um, and they want they want Two Stickney arrested. And they say, well, this involves one state's military against another state's military. This case ought to go right to the Supreme Court. And if you can imagine today in, in school, uh, if we were learning about the case Stickney versus Michigan, uh, that would be pretty interesting. But that's not what happened either. Um, what does happen is that militia from both states kind of keep this conflict going. Through the rest of the summer, through the fall, going into the winter, Michigan militia come down, Ohio's militia go up, no more shots are fired, nobody else is stabbed, but there's this tension around Toledo. Um, Ohio's negotiators go to Washington, D.C. for the settlement to try and figure out how are we going to settle this. One of the most important lawyers for Ohio is a guy named Noah Swain. And you guys might recognize that last name, Swain, because it's still on the landscape in Toledo today. Noah Swain has a son, also named Noah, who donates some land off Detroit Avenue near Monroe to become a baseball park in the early 1900s. And that baseball park was known as Swain Field. We'll talk about it later. Today, you guys are probably familiar with the McDonald's that's at the corner there at, at Monroe in Detroit. And that place is called Swain Field Shopping Center today. So Noah Swain and the Ohio negotiators go to D.C. to try and settle the war. Um, by the summer of 36, a year after the shots were fired, um, Michigan is told the only way you're getting statehood is if you give up the Toledo Strip. You are not going to be allowed to be a state unless you give up Toledo. And so Michigan finally kind of backs down. Michigan gets a very nice consolation prize with the Upper Peninsula. What they didn't know at the time is that the Upper Peninsula had lots of timber and lots of different um, uh, precious things underground, like copper and coal and iron ore. And um, I, I actually, I said coal, and I don't think there was coal up there, but there was, there was iron ore up there and copper. And the UP is going to provide untold wealth um, for the state of Michigan over the years. December 14th of 1836, Michigan finally signs off on the deal. And then the people in Toledo are like, all right, let's go. Well, well, the getting's good. Let's form our city officially. And so three weeks later, on January 7th of 37, Toledo formally incorporates. Toledo becomes a city um, as a direct result of the settlement of the Toledo War. Now, the early city. We're just going to talk a little bit about what the city was like in the beginning. The first mayor elected is John Burdan. You are obviously, uh, most of you aware, that Burdan Avenue goes through the west side, named after this first mayor. Um, in the first week, Burdan and the new city council uh, start trying to establish like a city government. And one of the things that's interesting, in that first week, one of the things that they do is they look into buying a couple of uh, fire engines. Now, back then, a fire engine wasn't what it is. Now, it's something towed by horses. But uh, what that means is that one of the oldest civic institutions in the city of Toledo is not the schools and it's not anything else. It's the fire department. The fire department is really one of our uh, TFRD, Toledo Fire and Rescue, is really uh, one of the first institutions created in the city of Toledo. Um, the other thing that's really interesting at this point is that Toledo basically ended at Summit Street. Um, you go from the river to Summit Street. So basically what is Promenade Park today over by Prometica, um, that's basically all that was Toledo. Um, and then down towards Swan Creek. When you got behind Summit Street, remember that Summit Street is at the top of a hill. When you got to the top of that summit and went over the back, what you had was a giant malarial swamp. 
people got lost in that swamp. Like, I am not kidding you. Where Government Center is today on Jackson Street, people would get back in the thickness of the wilderness and not be able to figure out what was north, south, east, or west. And there's a story of one person getting lost back in there uh, and having to wait until they heard church bells ring and then follow the sound of the church bells to get out of this thick swamp that is downtown Toledo today. Um, this is why Toledo became known as Frogtown. Um, because somebody said we have more frogs than we have people because this giant swamp right behind uh, what was downtown Toledo on Summit Street. Now, as all of this is going on, and this is why all of this is so critical, and we get back to these stupid canals again, me and my canals. Um, in the summer of 1836, at exactly the same time as Ohio and Michigan are fighting, Ohio announced that the Miami and Erie Canal was going to end in Manhattan. It wasn't going to end in Toledo, but it was going to have a side cut into Swan Creek. We'll talk about it in just a little bit. Construction of that canal begins in 1837. And prior to 1837, you had lots of people from backgrounds out east. Okay, You had lots of people settling in Toledo who were from Connecticut, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania. A lot of them had English or Scots-Irish heritage, but it's not like we had a dominant ethnic group in the city. In 1837, it's the beginning of Toledo's Irish population, and it's the canal workers. Why are the canal workers brought here from Ireland? Because they're cheap. The Irish would work for almost nothing. So you'd import all these Irish to work on the canal. Lots of them are going to die of malaria digging this canal. If you guys think about what, where does malaria come from? Mosquitoes. Where do mosquitoes end up? Stagnant water. What are these guys doing? Digging something for stagnant water. Um, so they're going to get absolutely ravaged by malaria and lots of Irish are going to die uh, all the way up from Toledo through Maumee to Grand Rapids, uh, up to Napoleon and Defiance. Um, these guys are going to be digging this canal, these Irish. And those Irish, um, some of them are going to settle in Toledo, and they're going to settle south of the canal. So the old South End that we think of as a Latino neighborhood today was really Toledo's original Irish neighborhood way back in the day. The other nickname that Toledo gets as this era goes on is Corn City. And you are listening to this right now like what Frogtown glass city maybe corn city yes when the canal opens in 43 it connects fort wayne and cincinnati to toledo toledo is now connected with other great cities in the west toledo is now really on a meteoric rise to becoming a big city why is this here's what you couldn't do at fort wayne at Fort Wayne, you can't take stuff off a canal boat and put it on a ship. At Toledo, you can. At Cincinnati, you can put it from one canal boat to a bigger canal boat. And that's about it. But at Toledo, you could access the rest of the world because of that Erie Canal that we talked about. At Toledo, I want to show you where the canal and the river came together and what it looked like back then. So here's good old Swan Creek. All right. And here's where Swan Creek exits into the river. And you guys know where this is because this is where Owens Corning and uh, Owens Corning's headquarters is with that big red half dome thing down from the baseball stadium. So today where the baseball stadium is, is like right about here. Okay. Baseball stadium is right about here. Owens Corning is right down here. This spit of land here is called the middle grounds. The middle grounds was in the middle of the creek and the river. Um, and eventually they're going to fill in a lot of this here. This is all land today. What was water back then in the middle grounds is all land today. Um, but back then, the middle grounds was where uh, the real action happened. So let me show you. Here's where the canal comes into town. The canal comes into town on the south end. Then the canal keeps going through town. There was actually a canal bridge. They built an aqueduct that where the boats went over the top of Swan Creek, which I think is totally bad stuff okay and not bad in a bad way I mean bad awesome um, so you got this aqueduct that takes the canal in downtown and it basically went between Michigan and Erie Street so if you'd walked out if you know where the library is today if you walked out front of the library the canal would have been you know less than a block away from you 
So the canal went through downtown, and that was the real canal. Now remember, the real canal goes up to Manhattan and ends at Manhattan. The side cut for the canal is what became so important, because right here, you could actually turn right on the canal. So if you were coming out of Fort Wayne this way and turned right, this thing called the side cut dumped you into Swan Creek, okay? Then your canal boat comes down Swan Creek, down this cut here, and your canal boat can dock here. And right there, the canal boats meet the ships. This is why Toledo is a big place. Now, those canal boats, lots of them unload here. Lots of them unload here. Lots of them unload right over here, off of Broadway, going up on Lafayette, going up on Monroe, going up on Washington. Why are they unloading? Okay, those canal boats aren't sticking around. When a boat comes into port, it unloads its cargo and it gets going back to where it came from to get more stuff. So, if you can't load the stuff directly on a ship, where do you keep it? You keep it in a warehouse. All of this part of Toledo becomes really important because this is where they're going to store the stuff that comes in on the canal boats to go out on ships and the stuff that comes in on ships to go inland on canal boats. This becomes what we still know today as the warehouse district of Toledo. You guys know where the spaghetti warehouse is downtown? Uh, off of Lafayette, that's the warehouse district. The Mud Hen Stadium is in the warehouse district. That's that's why we call it the warehouse district. It starts here. Why is that a big deal? Warehouses are really awesome places. Um, not because you want to hang out in them or anything, but because they make a lot of money. Um, when I have my corn put in a warehouse, I basically have to pay rent on it. Okay, and so the warehouse becomes a place where people make money off of products just basically sitting there. Um, these warehouses become the backbone of Toledo's economy. And they really, really, really tell this important story of how transportation makes Toledo what it is. We were the place where the canal and the river came together, where the canal and the access to the lakes came together. And that is what we were. That was our identity. And because so much of it was corn, the identity of this city was Corn City. Give you one crazy thing to think about real quickly. In the year 1850 alone, $311 million worth of corn came through Toledo. And Toledo made a slice of that money, a slice of that profit. Toledo made by warehousing that corn for maybe just a couple days maybe as long as a couple months. Warehousing is what built Toledo initially. In our next video, we'll talk about the next steps with transportation, because transportation is about to change forever with the railroad. And Toledo is going to find a way to make the railroad part of its transportation economy too. Guys, thanks for sticking with me through a long video. I hope you found this remotely interesting, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care, and be well.